My name is Sean Wilson. Um, I'm the statewide organizer for the ACLU's campaign for Smart Justice. Um, thank you for joining us all tonight for our weekly town hall, Smart Justice During COVID. Um, tonight we're gonna be joined by Julie Grace. Tonight we are joined by um, Julie Grace, um, policy analyst um, in the Badger Institute's um, Center for Opportunity. Last week, the Badger Institute uh, released a report called um, Racial Disparities in the Criminal, Legal, Criminal Justice System in Wisconsin, What We Know Thus Far. And so before I kick it off to um, Julie to discuss that report, I just want to say a few things. Um, some things that I think many of us already know, um, some things that I believe that um, has been reported in the media in the last couple of months, and that is how Wisconsin or um, racing in Milwaukee has some of the worst disparities um, in the country. Um, as it relates to criminal justice, um, we are number two in the country in our incarceration of um, black males. Um, we know that this is a problem. Um, we have, you know, shouted from the mountaintops to our elected officials that this is a problem. And we um, continue to ask them to begin to address this problem, to begin to put forth policy that um, is going to eliminate racism within our criminal legal system. However, um, they're not listening, in my opinion. And so I'm um, asking our viewers to continue to um, follow our efforts and, and, and look for ways that you can contribute to the efforts that we're making to um, bring about change within our criminal legal system. Um, we're asking you to hold our elected officials accountable. There's going to be a lot of promises made um, as we go into this election cycle. But I ask you all to ask the hard questions of our elected officials. Uh, what are they going to do to begin to address uh, racism within our criminal legal system? What are they going to do to begin to um, eliminate the $1 billion price tag that our correctional um, system is costing taxpayers? What are they gonna do um, to eliminate the $200 million that we are paying to reincarcerate men and women who have violated a rule of supervision? Um, begin to ask our elected officials these hard questions and hold them accountable when you go cast um, your ballot. And so um, tonight we're gonna be talking about uh, racial disparities in the criminal justice system in Wisconsin and as I said, uh, we're joined by Julie Grace, um, policy analyst from the Badger Institute. I will pass it to her um, to talk about, you know, her role at the Badger Institute, what the Badger Institute is. Um, thank you, Julie, for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Sean. Um, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, hopefully we can just have a good discussion. I'm happy to share our research, but um, also interested in hearing from others and answering questions that I can and, and learning as we go. Um, so the Badger Institute, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, research institution. We call ourselves a think tank, um, guided by the beliefs that free markets and limited government um, are essential to our way of life. Um, so we perform research on many different policy issues in the state, and I won't go into all of those, but like Sean mentioned, I work for our Center for Opportunity, which focuses mostly on poverty alleviation, criminal justice issues, occupational licensing, um, issues that we hope will, will help create more opportunity for people in Wisconsin. Um, Sean, do you want me to go into the report, or did you have anything else that you wanted to add first? Um, no, absolutely. Um, please go into the report. Um, sure. Sure, so, um, and I'll try to, to follow the chat um, if there's any questions or comments along the way. But um, like Sean said, last week we released a report um, that detailed racial disparities in Wisconsin's criminal justice system. And so, you know, we do a lot of research on the criminal justice system in Wisconsin. And we are have strong beliefs that in order for us to reform the system, we all need to be on the same page of what the issues and problems are. And the way that we go about doing that is through solid research and data. Um, and so as we're doing this research, you know, we've done, we've, we've worked on this area for years now. Um, it's really hard to do that without noticing the racial disparities that exist. They are so ingrained in Wisconsin's criminal justice system. And I'll talk about that in more detail, but um, 
we just thought that releasing this brief that's kind of a compilation of some of the research we've done seemed like it seemed like the right time to do it um like sean said wisconsin's among the worst in the country for racial disparities in the criminal justice system um and so the approach that we took to this is that There's so many components to it. And so we, in an attempt to kind of break it down, um, we looked at the Department of Corrections, we looked at police, prosecutors, and the courts, um, each of which kind of equally make up what we, you know, we, we think equally make up the criminal justice system. Um, and so what we did is we compiled research from all those areas and put them into this brief. I do want to say um, when I'm going through this, I will be speaking in kind of large macro number quantitative terms, but um, that, you know, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that every number that I say is, is a, a person in this system. Um, and I don't want to lose sight of that, even though, like I said, I know I'm going to be speaking in, in big terms, but maybe in the Q&A we can break it down to more of the, on the individual level. Um, so we have done most of our research in the area of corrections. Just to, to paint the picture, um, I think these numbers are from December of last year, so pretty recent. Um, of the 23,000 people incarcerated in Wisconsin's prison system today, or in December, 42% um, were black. That is six times higher than the proportion of the black population in our state as a whole. So right, right there really explains that. Should get the most attention. Um, but to DOC's, I don't know if I want to say credit, but but to be fair, they really don't have much discretion as to who's being incarcerated and ever since um, truth and sentencing when people are being released, except of course um, for revocations, which as most, most of us probably know is when someone is on community supervision and um, they violate a term and their, their uh, probation or extended supervision is terminated and they're revo revoked and they get sent back. So um, last year we did a pretty extensive research on that. We found that just in 2016, 5,400 uh, people were revoked in Wisconsin. Um, I know, Sean, you probably have better numbers on how many of those are for technical violations or crimeless revocations. Um, so DOC does have, like I said, discretion on who is being sent to prison for revocations. Um, and there's, there's, disparities in that as well. Um, the Columbia Justice Lab did a great report on this topic, and in it they found that Blacks make up 42% of the revocations in Wisconsin. However, they only make up 25% of people on community supervision. So if all else was equal, of course, um, they would represent 25% of revocations rather than 17 percentage points higher than that. Um, but of course, not all else is equal. Um, so um, it's hard to speculate, of course, why this is the case. And, and like I said, I'm speaking on kind of large research number type level. Um, I'm sure many people have personal stories that, that might have some ideas as to why and, and happy to hear those and excited to hear those as well. Um, but some people speculate, you know, um, is that because there are more police contacts in the city of Milwaukee? Um, of course, the more that you are kind of, this just goes for anyone, not even someone on supervision, the, the more you're watched or the more closely you're watched, the more likely you are to mess up. I mean, that's just kind of human nature. If you're looking for people to violate terms of supervision, it's more easy for them to be revoked. Um, doesn't make it right. And once again, that's just like one idea, but we found large disparities with, with regards to revocations and um, DOC, the population that DOC cares for as well. Um, so clearly we need, but, but let me just back up for a second before I move on to the next section. Um, I just gave some numbers, but I just wanna make a quick plug. There's still so much that we don't know. And so, you know, when, when we're in the Capitol or we're talking to legislators and or just anyone, and they say, um, what is the 
proportion of blacks on probation, DOC doesn't know that. And that's a problem because like I said at the beginning, in order for us to convince the legislature and the state as a whole that we need reforms, we need to be on the same page with what the problems are. And right now, DOC does not have to, and therefore they don't, report um, demographics for people on supervision. They don't report um, lengths that, that people are being sentenced to for extended supervision or probation, which we have very long lengths in Wisconsin. They don't even report um, the success rate, which you would, you know, if someone is completes their supervision, you think that's something that we would want to know. Um, they also don't report why people are being revoked. And that's the thing that we kind of always talk about, we always come back to. We really need to have better data on why people are being sent back to prison. Um, those are held in kind of closed door hearings and, and that's certainly something that the public deserves to know. Um, so the next section that we kind of looked at was the judiciary. Um, and basically found that it's extremely hard, or a few studies that we looked at concluded that it's extremely hard to determine what extent race plays in, in decisions by judges um, because, and, and this is kind of more my perspective on it, um, disparities that exist elsewhere, whether it's in housing, in education, um, those get rolled right into the courtroom. And so it's really hard to predict whether it's the judge that's, that's sentencing someone, if there's racial bias going on there, or if, if they're, you know, judges take into account lots of other factors, many of which are, once again, um, there's racial disparities. So it's hard to kind of determine this one, um, and it's difficult to prove, um, but they certainly do exist. And, and once again, we, we need more information on this. I'm, I'm not going to say we don't. Um, one kind of interesting area that, that we looked into a few years ago was um, how many people and, and who in Wisconsin was getting crimes expunged. Um, so we looked at like 10,000 cases over like seven years. Um, and I'll, I'll read this off so I get the numbers correctly. Um, Blacks represented 23% of people who were eligible for expungements, but only 10% of the crimes that were actually expunged. Whereas whites represented 63% of the eligible um, expungements and 79% of the, the expungements that were actually implemented. Um, and so once again, it's hard to ignore these disparities when, when you, when the research very clearly states that in Wisconsin, if you are a black defendant, you are less likely to get your crime expunged than if you're a white defendant. Um, so uh, just wanted to add that real quick. Um, the next kind of portion of the criminal justice system we looked at um, is prosecutors. And so we looked at the study that was released maybe a, a few months ago, earlier this year, by the Milwaukee DA's office. And they worked with the MacArthur Foundation and uh, University of Loyola Chicago. And what was, was really different about this study, and it even took me some time to kind of wrap my head around it, is because usually when we think about disparities, we compare you know, the population as a whole, like I did at, at the beginning of this presentation, we compare the population as a whole to the population that's in, incarcerated. What this study did is that it looked just at the population that was presented to the DA's office and whether the DA's office decided to charge that person or not. Um, what it found is that if you just look at that population, at least in the Milwaukee DA's office, there weren't really many racial disparities as to who's getting charged with the crime. But I do want to add this because this is a huge caveat. Um, so there, it, between Black, Whites, and Hispanics, it was pretty much the same across the board as who was getting charged with the crime. But, this is big, um, the percentage of um, cases presented for charging, which means people picked up by the police in Milwaukee County, um, Whites represented 22% of people presented for charging, and they represent 64% of the population. Whereas Blacks in Milwaukee County, represent 27% of the population, 
but 66% of the cases presented for charging. And so while the results of the study were, were favorable for people being charged in the courthouse in Milwaukee County, you kind of have to roll it back and look at the, the police context. Of course, you're not gonna end up at the courthouse unless you're picked up by the police, et cetera. Um, and there are large disparities, very large disparities there. Um, almost flipped the, the population of blacks and whites and the likelihood that they will be um, arrested, basically. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy, I, I don't have a better word. Um, and so, um, we, we, like I said, this isn't by no means a comprehensive look at every issue, racial issue in the criminal justice system. I don't wanna claim that it is at all. Um, but we, we, we have a few ideas um, that could perhaps help alleviate even a little bit of a small amount of these issues. Um, if I can just hop in yeah. one real quick to, to ask you a question. Um, so, so in this moment, we're talking about elections a lot. Yeah. And uh, um, judges and prosecutors, their elected positions. Um, can you talk about why it might be hard to determine if a judge or a prosecutor is uh, making racially biased decisions? And I am sorry, you know, to interrupt, you know, during no, the presentation. Thank you. I felt that it was, it's, it was pertinent to ask that questions. Yeah. Um, you were speaking about um, yeah, yeah, yeah. prosecutors. Yeah, and and I'll admit this is one of the areas that I'm I'm not super well versed in, but um, the easiest, simplest, but not the best answer is that it's really hard to prove racial bias. It's easy to prove racial disparities, and it's easy to show you know the numbers, but it's really hard to prove that a person or a judge is sentencing someone because of the color of their skin. And this is why I said, you know, judges of course take into account um, education or employment or other issues like that. And so therefore it's, it's a trickle down effect. You know, I mean, if, if there's racial disparities or racial bias in education, employment, housing, um, judges are allowed to take those things into consideration. And so, you know, the outcome of that, of course, could be disparate outcomes in, in the judicial system. Um, but this is just one of those examples where, unfortunately, it all, it all interconnects. And, you know, we only chose to look at the criminal justice system, but we all know we could have looked at many other issues and, and connected them. Um, so I don't really have a great answer to that question, Sean, but at least from the studies we looked at from Marquette and um, I forget who wrote the other one. That was kind of the conclusion. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. You. Um, I'll just kind of finish with a few um, points. One of which is I'll just start off. We need to figure out a better way to weed out bad police officers, um, obviously. Um, and, and we're we're doing some more research on that now. Um, but open to other ideas as to how people think that that, that could happen in Milwaukee and, and elsewhere. Um, like I said, we need better data. We need to, and I know it sounds so like, like minuscule, like why would that actually impact change? Um, but I think as Sean said, um, uh, we're trying to convince legislators and sometimes um, that's the best way to do it. And so um, that's why we keep harping on that and um, we probably can, will continue to do so. Um, and then the final thing, which this is another, a, another aspect that absolutely blew my mind when we were doing the research for this, um, we need to make sure that there's better legal representation and that everyone has a fair shot when they're in the courtroom, regardless of the color of their skin. Um, in Wisconsin, let me make sure I, I have this number correct because it's crazy. In Wisconsin, um, an individual has to make under $12,524 to qualify for a public defender, which is actually so low that it's below the federal poverty line. Um, the federal poverty line, which I think most people nowadays think is really not the best measure anyways, but the federal poverty line now sits at $12,760. And so 
quite literally in Wisconsin, you have to be living below that to qualify for a public defender. Um, which, and in, in that's beside the fact that many public defenders are extremely overworked, high caseloads, and, you know, that's a separate conversation, but um, we need to make sure that people are getting a fair shot, and um, that's, that's something else that we'll definitely be looking into. Um, uh, any questions before I keep rambling? Yes, we have, um, we have one, one question we just got sure. in um can you talk about the reason the reasons for the racial disparities and revocations you found and how you think that might play out differently in milwaukee versus other parts of the state right um so like i said um there's more of a police presence in milwaukee than there are in in other areas of the state um so just from like a human level or I don't know common sense level the more <clears throat> the more you're being watched or or the more someone's looking for you to looking at you to mess up more likely they're going to find you messing up um regardless of whether that's legitimate or not um in other parts of the state there's just not the same level of police presence um many times many times and this is what I research found um, revocations aren't even from the probation or parole agent. It's people being picked up by the police. They see that they're on supervision and it's easier, sometimes it's easier to revoke them than it is to charge them with a new crime. That's something that, that we see a lot of times happening. Um, but I would recommend definitely if someone's interested in that, reading the, um, both our report on the issue, but also the Columbia Justice Lab one was really, really great. Um, and it kind of, I could go on about supervision, but it kind of shows how Wisconsin's an outlier um, in regards to our supervision rate, um, or I should say our extended supervision rate, probation not as much, but since we don't have caps in Wisconsin on how long people can be on extent, or community supervision, um, that's another reason why, why people get revoked more is because they're being watched for longer periods of time. Um, the federal system caps their probation at five years. Other states, it's like two or three. Wisconsin is no, right. yeah, <laughs> there is no end. Um, it's however long they want it to be. Yeah. Um, so that's another reason why, once again, the longer you're being watched, the more likely you are to be found messing up, I guess. Okay. Um, we have another question. Um, Oh, I see a question from Sean. Yep. Um, the question is, do you find the need to add a historical context when presenting the data to Department of Corrections in regards to the majority of the prison population are black men? Definitely, yeah. And, and, and I should have actually mentioned that, Sean. Um, in our report, there's a chart that shows the Wisconsin prison population by race from just 2000 to 2019. And um, what it shows is that from 2000 to 2015, the racial disparities were actually getting a little bit better. And, and I say better in you know relative terms, but um, in the past, so, but in the past five years, or they, they've actually gotten worse. And so, um, the, so from 2000 to 2015, the proportion of white inmates increased by 10%, which would make sense because the state's population is largely white. Um, and the proportion of black inmates decreased by 12%. So that's from 2000 to 2015. Um, from 2015 until today, the trends have actually reversed. Um, and the proportion of white inmates has um, decreased and the proportion of black inmates has increased. And so, I don't know the reason for that or if there is one, but it's certainly worth exploring and and um it's it's disheartening, I guess, you know, when we seem to be going in the right direction for um fifteen years and all of a sudden the last five we've kind of reversed that. So um and that's actually from a DOC report, I should say. Um so I they're aware of it and um but once again they don't have much discretion on entirely who's being who's being sent to prison 
And um, also, I want to thank you, Julie, for that. And uh, also, thank you, Sean, for that question. Um, I just also want to add, because I know um, we're throwing a lot of numbers at you. We're throwing a yeah. lot of data at you. And, and, and so I want to make sure that we're also tying in um, the human data. And yeah. um, one thing about the Smart Justice campaign, um, the work that we're doing is centering the leadership of directly impacted people, as well as centering the voices of directly impacted communities. So as Julie mentioned early on, that behind each one of these numbers is an individual. So we, everything she's saying, we've heard in some capacity, capacity from someone who has been impacted by the criminal legal system, um, directly. I myself have been impacted by the criminal legal system directly. And so everything that she is saying, um, as it relates to the reports from the DOC, um, they are factual because some of this is the, the, that, the data that we have saw and have read ourselves. But um, we, we've gone further in reaching out to individuals who have been impacted directly by the criminal legal system here in the state of Wisconsin, because those are the individuals, these are the communities that inform how we engage legislators and policy um, folks on what they need to do to bring about transformational change within this system. And so it's very important that folks understand that um, even though you're hearing a lot of um, numbers thrown at you, um, there is a face, a family, and a community um, that represents these numbers. So don't, don't focus so much on the numbers. Um, think about those families, um, in, in most cases, black and brown, families and communities that are impacted um, in the numbers in which uh, we're um, given to you. And um, with that, we'll, we'll jump to another question that we have from um, Ruben, um, who asks, is there current legislation that is being worked on to introduce a cap on probation? Yeah, well, first of all, Sean, thanks for, thanks for stepping in and reiterating that because I knew I was going to sound super number heavy, um, but that's why, that's why you exist, you know, I mean, that's, and, and I shouldn't say, I, I, I think numbers help, but I think personal stories fill in the gaps, Absolutely. you know, um, and so thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, to answer, Ruben, your question, there is not right now. There has been. Um, there was a legislation. Um, last session that would have um, attempted to do this. Um, I expect that this will be an issue that will probably pop up again this session. Um, uh, one of the, the um, best arguments, I guess, I mean, there's many, for reducing uh, supervision caps is, um, as we found in our research, most people are more likely to be revoked, honestly, even within the first six to 12 months since their, since their release date. Um, and so therefore, there's not much of a public safety benefit um, to keeping people on extended supervision or probation past three to five years. Um, once you reach that point, there's um, a, an unlikely chance that you're gonna be revoked. And so it, it hurts the offender who is on, or the person that's on supervision, it hurts the agent who has to spend their time or, you know, checking in with this person that's probably not going to revoke, be revoked. And uh, it hurts the taxpayer because we're paying for this person to be on supervision who doesn't really need to be anymore. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that, Julie. And yeah. just to add, um, we have, and there should be legislation. And as Julie said that there were um, last session, but we should have a cap. Currently in the state of Wisconsin, there are 68,000 um, people on probation, parole, and extended supervision. Um, we have, um, and, and you know, to just speak, speak up for agents um, who have, you know, clients, caseloads of over 100 people. And so imagine keeping tabs on over 100 people, you know, so they're overworked, um, they're overwhelmed, and so there needs to be a cap on probation and parole because if you have individuals exceeding that um, year mark, that two year, that three year mark, then there needs to be a conversation on how do we transition you off of probation, parole, or extended supervision because we know that the longer an individual is on um, this supervision, um, the likelihood of them um, reoffending is 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 pretty is pretty slim 
because they're walking on eggshells. So individuals need to be able to transition off of probation, um, pr um, parole, or extended supervision um, so that they can really um, begin to rebuild their lives and really begin to reintegrate fully in society and do not have to face the barriers um, when they're when they're changing jobs. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? Are you currently on probation or parole? Um, or even p participate in the civic um, um, process, you know, voting. You know, individuals who are on probation and parole and extended supervision who are on felony probation or parole and extended supervision aren't able to um, vote. So this is something that um, needs to happen. And this is something that I urge our viewers um, on Facebook as well as in the, our Zoom to, um, you know, ask these hard questions of your elected officials. Um, ask these hard questions of the policymakers. Um, ask these hard questions of our governor who, who ran on the platform of reducing the prison population by 50%, who ran on the pl um, platform of criminal legal reform. Um, ask these questions of the judges and the prosecutors um, who are running for re-election. There's, I believe, six um, prosecutor re um, elections going on in the state of Wisconsin right now. Um, and, and I think it's six, but um, my colleague Molly can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But, you know, ask these hard questions of these folks who are um, uh, running to get our vote. And I think we have some more questions here. Um, Sean, you kind of just answered this next question. Um, but I feel like that's more your, up your alley if you'd like to um, tell it about the best way to impact change. Um, the best way, okay, so what would you say is the best way to impact change both for criminal justice students and for the general public? I mean, uh, one thing, one thing that I, I, I do a lot whenever I'm going into um, the universities and speaking to um, students who are majoring in criminal justice um, in or law studies is that, um, I, I mean, I do it, you know, I recite a bunch of data to them. Um, and that resonates with them. But what really resonates with them, what really grabs their hearts and minds and, 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 and light a fire um, under them to begin to really want to have an impact on our criminal legal system is those personal stories. So I think that the way that we can impact um, criminal justice reform um, for the public as well as for students is for the public to be aware of the individuals who have been impacted by the criminal legal system, um, to be aware of what this system has done and what it continues to do in your name. So that is one way. Um, and I think that is probably the most impactful way um, that um, um, impactful change can, can come. And then um i have another question off of facebook um are are these problems part of the reason uh reasons why wisconsin prisons are overcrowded i'll let you kick that off um Jim. yeah we could talk about this one for a while um partially i guess is the short answer um yeah I, i'll just start with the revocation issue um i think i said in 2016 like 5,400 people were sent back to prison just for revocation. That in and of itself um, certainly adds to the overcrowding. Um, just in the past few months, that was actually one of the changes that DOC and Governor Evers implemented to try to redu reduce the prison population, um, at, at least temporarily, or at least we think it'll be temporary. Um, is that they they stopped revocations and Sean correct me if I'm wrong they stopped revocation almost all revocations but certainly all that were misdemeanors um, and I think all, I I forget exactly which other ones maybe all um, but um, that's one thing that adds to the the overcrowding of the prison population um, but this has been something that that's long deep in Wisconsin's history. Um, Sean, anything else you want to add on that? I mean, we can um, absolutely. We can I think this a few ways. Yeah, so so I think that um um if folks aren't aware um but crimeless revocation or the reincarceration of individuals for violating a rule of supervision is the number one driver in, back into our 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 um correctional system. So I I would definitely say that 
um, that is uh, one of the reasons why our prisons are overcrowded. The design capacity for uh, Wisconsin uh, correctional system is, I believe, 16,000, and currently we're at 23,000. 23, and so we have a, a law that was passed in 1999, um, December 31st, 1999, truth and sentence, sentencing, which requires um, individuals to serve 100% of their um, time. Um, there was no early release um, programs available for individuals to um, get out of prison early. So truth and sentencing is something that also has contributed to um, the overcrowding issue in the state of Wisconsin. And we also have a program here in Wisconsin. Um, I don't know when this program came into effect, but I know it came into effect after um, truth and sentencing called the Earn Release Program. This is a six month um, drug intensive program, six to nine month program that allows you to cut a year off of your sentence. So if you complete this sentence, you're able to reintegrate back into the community after you have received this treatment. And that um, is a early release program um, for individuals in our, in our state prisons. Currently there are 750 beds, um, occupied beds might I add, um, for, this, for this program. And there are over three to 4,000 people on the waiting list for this program. And so last session during our joint finance, during the joint finance um, committee hearings, when we did a st um, state um, statewide tour, we were asking for an expansion of this program because this program would, you know, it's a release valve. If we were able to expand this program, um, more folks will be able to get into this program, receive the treatment that they are in need of and reintegrate back into their community as a result of them um, receiving that treatment. And so we're continuing to ask for that um, treatment to be, you know, I mean, for that program to be expanded, but um, certainly um, truth and sentencing, um, the, the, the primary driver um, being crimeless revocation um, is, is the cause for our current overcrowding issues. In addition to um, you have over two to 3,000 individuals who are still in prison under the old law um, awaiting uh, release who have been in prison for over 20 years and are continuing to be denied parole um, because um, letting them out would depreciate the seriousness of the crime uh, when they are already working in the community on work release. Um, so I can go on and on, but I, I'll stop there. But that is the reason um, why we are um, in a state of overcrowding right now. Which, by the way, I'll just add, um, in last budget, the last budget cycle, there was actually discussion of, of Wisconsin building a new prison, um, which would have costed, I think, they said it would, it would have costed about $300 million, Sean, and we estimated it, it would have been much higher. Um, but of course, now that we have a global pandemic and a, a recession in the state, that's simply not going to be an option anymore. Um, and so unless there's large structural changes to um, policies that reduce that number, um, we're going to have that conversation all over again. And so, but, but what, like I said, now that there's kind of, well, there is a financial crisis, um, they're going to have to do something. So we have one more, um, another question from Sean. Um, in all of your research, have you found that other states use the preponderance of evidence within their administrative policies and rules in regards to the revocation process? Hmm. So Sean, I'm actually in the process of looking through all of our neighboring states, supervision and revocation policies. Um, and so I haven't gotten there yet, but I will do that and I will let you know what I find. Um, it's, it is super interesting though, and I'll just say this real quick, um, how other states are set up and even are as close as Illinois or Minnesota have drastically different policies um, uh, for people on supervision and the revocation process. Um, so to answer your question, I, I don't know right now, but I will in the next few weeks. Absolutely. And we know that this is a national problem. This is something that affects all 50 states. And um, so um, in Wisconsin, it's an outlier, you know, here in our in our own uh, region, we're an outlier, we're the worst in this region. And so we have to begin to think about 
um, how we resolve this issue. And uh, we, we, we heard, you know, from our governor and we hear from several um, elected officials, you know, a champion criminal legal reform um, policies, but we have yet to see anything um, come into effect. And that is because there's a lot of partisan politics that is happening in Madison. And um, again, um, it's going to, um, it's, it's on us. It's on us, the citizens of Wisconsin, um, to force our elected officials to put forth um, smart criminal justice policy. It's on us. We have to demand that if they want our vote, if they want to remain in office, then they need to be in Madison figuring out how we're going to divest from our correctional institutions, I mean, our correctional system, and invest in education, for example, which was something that we um, asked for last session was a divestment from our correctional system and an investment in our educational system because we're spending um, more money on locking people up than we are on educating people. We're spending over $100,000 to lock up one juvenile, one kid. And we can, we can just imagine how many young people we can send to college with that $100,000, $120,000 that we're spending to lock them up. So it's going to take us uh, as a, a constituency to hold these elected officials accountable and begin to demand that they do something um, effective and something different. I heard someone say recently, Sean, that the criminal justice system is the only government program, or if you want to compare sales, it gets larger and it gets more money, um, which is, is kind of interesting um, and discouraging, of course. But um, just one more area, because I know you were talking about how Wisconsin is an outlier. This is another one that I always come back to, which is that in Wisconsin, on, if you're on extended supervision or probation um, and you do end up getting revoked, you don't get credit for all the time that you've served in compliance. And so um, I think there was a question about community supervision lengths. This is how lengths become decades long in the state is because you don't get time, you don't get credit for the time that you served in compliance if you're revoked. So let's say you get supervision, probation for or extended supervision for like four years, you're revoked in the third year in the sixth month, you, and you get, you get sent back to prison, you don't get time, you don't get credit for that, that time, you have to start all over again. And so this is where we just see the cycle, a never ending cycle, um, which I, recently, um, I don't know if you've seen this, Sean, DOC started releasing um, data on every person that's incarcerated in the state today. Um, and so I, I was looking at that the other day and um, I was filtering by the reason for their, their incarceration. And when I pulled out the people who were there for their the first offense, new crime, which most people would think, well, that's probably most in, in prison, that actually only makes up half of Wisconsin's prison system. Everyone else is there for a revocation, um, whether it's a crimeless revocation or a new crime. Um, but I just thought that that was super interesting that only half half of the people in prison today are there for their first offense and, and serving time for that. So yeah, that's and I haven't saw that, but I know that um, the yeah. Columbia Justice Lab, as well as um, the Smart Justice Blueprint, had mentioned that forty five percent of all new emissions in 2017 were um, as a result of crimeless revocation mm -hmm. or as a result of their parole or probation or extended supervision being revoked. Um, that's a problem. Um, and that, in fact, goes to um, one of the questions that we have here um, from Jonathan, who asks, is part of the problem um, the whole design of the community supervision system? Um, is it set up to catch people rather than set up to support their successful re-entry and uh, reintegration? Well, of course, the point of supervision is to help people um, re-enter the community. Um, extended supervision is, is actually the completion of someone's sentence. So with truth and, with truth and sentencing, you have to serve um, 
your extended supervision, I think it's like 25% of the time that you were in prison or something like that. So it's also an, ex an, also an extension or a completion of your sentence. Um, but I, I think that would maybe depend on probation agents and, and you know, they're individuals too. And so one agent might see their role as um, a quasi police officer or, or, you know, and another might see their role more as a social worker trying to help their, their client reenter society and get set up with a job and, and, you know, housing and education. Um, so I think it, it depends. Um, but there certainly is an aspect of, um, you know, Sean can talk about this and you guys have done great work on this issue. Everyone that's on extended supervision in Wisconsin has 18 rules they have to follow or 16 or 18. Um, and many have many more. Um, and, you know, some of them probably make sense. Some of them that have no relation to the crime that was committed probably don't. Um, and so I think that's another area where if you're getting revoked for um, a rule violation that, that had to do with the original crime, perhaps that makes somewhat sense. But if you're getting revoked for a rule violation that had nothing to do with the reason that you were sentenced at all, it's hard to, to see it not being a, a gotcha or, you know, a trying to catch someone type thing. Yeah, it is. It is. I believe um, the standard rules, I believe it, there are 16 to 18, but there can be um, more. I, re I recall when we did our statewide tour last year, we had a former um, parole agent on um, one of our um, town halls who was a panelist on one of our um, town halls. And she and she flat out said that, you know, as an agent, I can just if, if I came into work and I felt like I wanted to add five more rules to the 18 or the 25 rules that you already have. And most of these rules are redundant. Um, so if I felt that, like I wanted to just add five more rules on there, I can just add five more rules on there without any accountability to no one. And I can arbitrarily say that you violated this rule and I can um, begin the process um, to send you back to prison. And as Julie said, you know, you have these, you have some agents who feel as though they're quasi um, law enforcement and you have agents who really want to help individuals reintegrate back into the community and are doing everything in their power to help them find, find housing, um, find um, employment, um, transportation, et cetera. And, and, and there are um, agents who have very good intentions. I, I know um, many agents um, here in the city of Milwaukee who are very intentional in ensuring that um, they're acting in the best interest of their clients and helping them uh, reintegrate successfully back into the community, that they're doing everything in their power to keep them from um, reoffending and uh, reentering the correctional system. So you have um, a, a bunch of bad apple agents who have no good intention other than to send you back, to send individuals back to prison. Um, and that's problematic. And that's a conversation that we have been having with um, community corrections, the administrators of uh, community corrections. And we will continue to have these conversations uh, with those folks because the objective, as Julie said, is uh, successful reintegration back into the community and not to, you know, uh, play I gotcha or to, act as a surveilling agent agency, but that is the narrative that community corrections have, and they need to begin to uh, figure out how um, they can change and disrupt that narrative that is out there about them, um, uh, in addition to uh, working with legislators and um, individuals within community corrections to figure out how we can put a cap on probation and parole so that their caseload can be um, short. And um, so, I have I've received a question from um, someone um, who said, what is the status of the release of old law um, inmates? Um, or I would say individuals, um, to the individual who asked that question on Facebook, uh, we try to use people first language when we're talking about men and women who are within our carceral setting. Um, so we steer away from um, inmate, convict, et cetera. Uh, we're going to call them um, individuals or persons. Um, I, I, I know this brother, this, 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 my homie. So I ain't going to put him on blast, but um, he know. 
uh, you know, bro. But anyway, so the status of old law individuals, um, as everyone know that um, Chairman um, John Tate is the parole chair, um, and and he has been, you know, releasing a lot of folks. Um, he has been handing out a lot of grants. In fact, um, in in his first year, um, he has issued out more grants um, than the previous two years. So he handed out more grants in one year than were handed out in the previous two years. So there's a lot of folks who may say that he's not doing enough um, and he needs to do more. Um, I will say to those folks on his behalf, um, keep in mind that he has yet to be confirmed. Keep in mind that there's a lot of par par partisan politics that is happening in the state of Wisconsin. And so he can easily not be confirmed if he was to do what you want him to do, which is open the floodgates. So he has to be um, mindful in um, how he goes about releasing these folks. And hey, I'm one of those individuals who wants him to, you know, just release all of these individuals who have served um, 20 plus years. And many of these individuals I know, you know, I've, I've been in the same dorm in the same cell and, and, and went to child and wreck with these individuals. So um, believe me, um, I'm urging him to, you know, do those things um, as many of you are urging him and, um, and, and, and demanding him that he does these things as well. Um, but that's what's happening um, with, with the um, individuals um, who are under the old law. And then, the next question I'll toss to you, Julian, that is, is this something that Governor Evers is focusing on now? Um, it's something he could be. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I will say um, Governor Evers and DOC did implement some, um, what we think or assume are temporary changes um, to address coronavirus in prisons and some of those were um, pretty much halting uh, revocations and halting all new prison admissions, um, moving some people into county jails to help with the overcrowding issue. Um, but like I said, all of those measures um, are temporary, um, but all of those measures could become permanent um, if, if, you know, either administratively um, through DOC or um, legislatively through um, new laws. So um, I, I don't know how much it's on their radar more than that. Although like Sean said, um, it's something that he certainly ran on and um, we'll see, I guess, this new legislative session. We'll see if, if there's an appetite for reform. Um, there'll be somewhat of a different makeup in the legislature this session with um, some people retiring and some people up for reelection. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what it looks like in January and we'll report back then, I guess. Thank you. And we have, um, we have a few minutes before we have to end, but um, um, there's another question uh, from uh, Ruben directly to you, Julian. It is, um, does this apply for federal supervision as well or the only the sta only state where you do not get credit um, if you, you're revoked? That's a really good question. I think you get credit in the federal system. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and I even get myself mixed up sometimes. Um, there's a difference between just getting credit for time served as, and then there's another policy called compliance credits, which many states have, which that means um, time served in compliance means time off the end of the sentence. Um, Wisconsin does not have that either, but that's even a step further. We don't even in Wisconsin or people under supervision in Wisconsin don't even get credit for time served at all. Um, so I don't know about the federal system. I believe they do, but I would want to look into that and I will, and I'll let you know, Ruben. Okay, so one, I'm going to give you the last question from um, Samantha. Um, Sean, um, good question. I think we kind of answered that um, somewhat, but I, I, I'll build with you offline on that. Mm -hmm. um, but Samantha asks, what do you see 
future screening processes for law enforcement, POs, et cetera, looking like to ensure focus on rehabilitation and setting folks up for success versus the gotcha punitive mentalities? This is, I, I like this question to end on because I'm gonna bring it back to what we said at the beginning of this, which is that every person on, on supervision in Wisconsin is different than the next, right? Every person on supervision has different needs. Um, and so a one-size-fit-all approach to someone who might have um, mental health issues or addiction issues, their supervision plan should certainly be different than someone who, who doesn't. Um, and, you know, a lot of times the criminal justice system is the catch-all to solve a lot of these issues, whether that's mental health or addiction um, drug or alcohol, um, what have you, and it's not equipped for that. And so I think better, I, I, I know this is kind of not a, a specific answer, but better services and more individualized um, case plans for people on supervision, I think would go a long way. Thank you, Julie. Thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you for um, reporting out on, on your report, on a report card that you are uh, released last week. Um, we appreciate you. And um, this is a collaborative effort. Um, this is a, a, a nonpartisan problem or, or a nonpartisan created problem. And it's going to take a nonpartisan solution um, to, 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 to resolve um, this problem. And so um, again, thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, we do this every Wednesday with a different subject. Um, so continue to follow us on all of our um, social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter. Um, also stay tuned. Next week we will be um, unveiling a Smart Justice uh, Facebook group so folks can continue to follow um, our efforts as we go about um, demanding um, smart criminal justice reform um, here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, you all can read the Badger Institute report. Um, my colleague Molly Collins is going to share the link in the Facebook chat um, as well as in the Zoom chat. Um, you can also um, check out the Columbia Justice Lab report. Um, she's also going to share that in the face Facebook and Zoom chat. Um, read also the Lo Loyola uh, report on race, ethnicity, and prosecution in Milwaukee County, uh, Wisconsin. That link will be shared as well. And um, before I close, um, the ACLU National, we in, in partnership with Prison Policy Initiative, we shared, we, um, we released a report card um, called Decarcerate During COVID, um, where Wisconsin, as well as all 50 or all other, the um, other 49 states received um, a failing grade with the exception of a few states. But Wisconsin received an F plus for um, their response um, to decarcerate during the height of the COVID pandemic. And um, that's a problem um, because we continue to fail, we continue to get it wrong, and that reflects um, poorly on our state legislature as well as on our governor, who is the executive of this state. Um, and it also makes us as citizens, as constituency, look bad because we are the one who voted these folks in office. So um, continue to hold your elected officials accountable, continue to ask the hard questions, continue to ask them um, to invest in people and not prisons, um, to invest in communities and, and, and not these systems that harm communities. Um, um, on Monday, um, all voting is local and all voting is local Wisconsin and um, the ACLU of Wisconsin, we released the ballots for all toolkit um, that supplements their recently released report ballots for all ensuring eligible vote, Wisconsin voters in jail have equal access um, to the ballot. Um, the toolkit offers voting advocate strategies for urging county officials to adopt policy so every eligible voter in Wisconsin um, and voter in jail can vote. Um, it, it includes concrete recommendations about how to engage county sheriffs, um, the media, advocates, um, and advocates to help remedy the shortfalls identified in the initial report. Um, among the tools 
um, is a policy checklist, a sample letter um, to the editor, um, and strategic guidance for how people can support voter registration in jails. Um, we're also going to share, my colleague Molly Collins is also going to share the link to get access to um, the cool toolkit so that you can use. Um, continue to follow us, continue to get engaged, um, because we're working 24-7 trying to figure out how we can get folks out of cages. Uh, we're in uh, collaboration and partnership with several organizations here in the city of Milwaukee and throughout the state uh, working um, to decarcerate West Wisconsin. Um, if you have a family member or you yourself have been impacted by the criminal legal system, um, please reach out to us, um, email me, um, hop on our Facebook thread, um, message us, um, get involved, get informed, and um, stay committed. Um, thank you all. Thank you again, Julie, and have a great rest of your night. Thanks, Sean.